here in Canada and most of the U.S. and actually in most of Europe right now, it's really cold and uh, there's snow everywhere. So if you're a gardener like me, you might have thought about setting up a little indoor space for growing fruits and vegetables or maybe just flowers indoors. In this video, I'll show you guys um, my little setup. I'm using a laundry room that I'm uh, reclaiming and turning that into a garden. And in this video, I'll show you specifically how to plant tomatoes or how I actually plant tomatoes. I'll give you a couple of tips and uh, we'll get set up. So let's get going. Alright, so let's talk about the setup a little bit. Uh, this is an old laundry room that's not being used anymore. Actually, it hasn't been used in, in a really long time. And so I've decided to convert that into an indoor garden. So uh, it's a basic, uh, basic suburban home basement with uh, a cement slab or concrete slab as a floor. The reason I picked this room is one, because it's, it's just straight on the concrete slab, but it also has a drain directly in the room. So that's going to help me with the watering situation, with any spillage that may happen, or uh, basically this is not a room that I need to keep clean, uh, as if, for example, we had hardwood floors. And so that's gonna help my effort quite a bit now. Uh, if you look at the pots that we have here on the left, I have my tomato plants, which uh, they've been started about uh, a month and a half ago or so, but they were pretty neglected, so they've turned yellow a little bit. Actually, they were in containers where they were overwatered, so they, they stayed yellow like this and they developed slowly. Uh, they were a bit short on light as well, so they became a little leggy. If we actually get up close here a little bit, you can see that uh, the plant is actually pretty tall. And the reason, the, sorry, the method we use to tell if the plant is lanky or not, by the way, or stretching, is the internode spacing. So if you look at one node, another node, and then we, we analyze or we calculate the distance between these two nodes here. And that's going to tell us whether the plant was stretching for light or not. So plants that are fully lit and that have all the light they need are going to be uh, compact plants. And compact plants really are plants with short internodes or tight internode spacing. So these guys are not so bad at this stage because they started getting good light lately. Uh, but, but as you can see, they are. Well, you can't, probably can't see it that well. I'll point it out though. But here on the stem, we had a node. Here we had another node. Uh, so it wasn't that bad, but it could have been better. We actually stripped all of the leaves, uh, well, all the way from here, all the way down. And the reason why I've got these, basically these 14 inch containers with the plant in the middle here is that we're going to fill up the container all the way to here so that's called uh, that's called burying plants to their shoulders and what that's going to do is the whole the whole part of the stem here that's completely uh, exposed right now which will be buried in the soil is actually going to root and we should get a stronger sturdier plant that picks up and, and uh, gets back to a healthy strong plant very quickly should produce quite a bit of tomatoes as well so so that's the technique basically. We started these plants in small jiffy pucks, then we transplanted them to a uh, to a eight inch container. I mean, normally we should have went to a four inch, but whatever. We didn't we didn't uh, have time to uh, to do all these up pots. And then at this stage, what we've done is we've basically uh, removed the plant from the eight inch container, put in that fourteen inch container here, and we're going to basically fill these these containers. I've got three like this, so the other one's over there. And then we'll be able to grow these guys and get fruit out of them uh, over the winter. Well, whatever is left of the winter at this point, because we're almost in Feb. But I'll show you guys that you can get some really good fruit and some really good yields indoors if you use the right equipment. So let's talk about our, uh, our, next, our next topic in this video. It's gonna be the lighting, super important. The light we're going to use in this garden is a double-ended, high-pressure sodium metal halide light. So that's the light we have in right now. You may see some flicker at the top of the video, and the reason for that is that although I'm using a really good camera, the light intensity coming out of this thing is just so strong and so intense that, that basically it messes up with the, uh, 
camera's ability to uh, to shoot a clear and steady picture in terms of lighting. So these are the latest technology that exists for greenhouse lighting. Now it's not an LED, it's really what they're going to use in greenhouses where they have tomatoes and fruit and vegetable production. This is extremely powerful. I'm going to attempt, and I'm really insisting on the word attempt, to uh, film the actual inside of the, of the light. Uh, and look at this. This is basically, oh, I'm surprised actually the camera is able to focus, but you see the bulb there. And if you look at both ends, it's easy to understand why it's called a double-ended, because it's connected at both ends. And using that kind of technology allows us to uh, get a lot more useful light out of these lights. So they're super efficient uh, in terms of uh, artificial lighting or photosynthetic lighting. To give you guys just an idea, if you're interested in the whole uh, history of indoor lighting and whatnot, Originally, the high-pressure sodium lights that existed are just like your street lights. So they were uh, magnetic. They use magnetic ballasts. These were about, let's say, one. Like we're going to say one as efficiency, and let's just start from there. That's going to be our baseline. So efficiency was one. Then we came out, or they came out, actually. The industry came out with electronic ballasts, and these guys were 1.7 in terms of efficiency. Uh, and that's micromole per joule, by the way, so if you're interested in, but that's 1.7 micromole per joule. And the, the lights we're actually looking at, these types of lights, the double-ended, high-pressure sodium, electronic ballast lights are closer to 2.1 moles per joule. So that's super, super efficient. Uh, they do put out a lot of heat uh, at this distance here, which is about a foot from the bulb. I, I wouldn't be able to stay there for very long, so... Uh, so you got to make sure your plants are pretty far away, but again, the penetration power of that light is photosynthetic active radiation levels are so high that you don't need to be close. And this is why this is what's used in the greenhouses. Now, this is a 1000 watt light. It actually, uh, it actually has a function where you can boost it to 1150 watts, which is what I have here. And so that's extremely powerful. Now it overdrives the light. It's not bad for the lamp or anything. They're designed to do this. So I have it on 1150 watts and that should allow us to nicely cover a five by five, probably a six by six area. Now, when I say nicely cover, I mean, you would be able to grow any plant that needs an extremely high level of light under a lamp like this one. Uh, so tomatoes, peppers, if you want to grow strawberries, if you want to grow bananas, if you want to grow anything at all, uh, pretty much this thing is a, a replacement for the sun. So uh, on a six by six radius, you're going to grow a whole lot of stuff really, really well, just like you would in the middle of summer. Now, so that's for the lighting. Now, next, uh, next little piece in this video, I'll talk to you quickly about my fertilizer. Uh, so stay tuned or stay with us. Uh, we're going to talk about plant food and what you should use indoor if you want to stay organic. So this is the plant food we use. It's the same uh, plant food or fertilizer that we use on the farm uh, on most of our crops. And it's going to be, actually this is a mix of a 532 uh, chicken manure fertilizer and a 468, which is chicken manure with uh, uh, potash sulfate. It has bone meal and feather meal. So you really have a strong combination of nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium in that mix along with a lot of micronutrients and it's approved for organic use. So uh, the company I buy it from actually has it in pellet form like this. So you guys can see it looks like little gravel or a little sand if you look up close. And this is not going to smell, this is not going to be uh, any trouble to use. Actually it will start going back to its original state uh, to stay polite once you actually wet it. So the trick with this stuff is to mix it into your containers or wherever you want to use it and once it's mixed, then water. Do not put it in contact with any form of moisture until you're ready to, to basically, uh, wh where it's in its final place. So uh, what I'm doing with this stuff here is I'm, I'm putting some in my containers as I'm transplanting those tomatoes in those 14 inch containers. I've got some throughout the container uh, and I've got some top dress like this. I'm gonna mix, oh, I'm gonna mix this in uh, a little better as well. And then I'll have I'll have fertilizer throughout the entire container. Now it's important that you mix it in thoroughly because there are nutrients which are mobile in the plant, such as nitrogen, uh, and they're water soluble as well. So 
when you water, even if you have those chicken pellets or this, these chicken manure pellets or on top, whatever part of that is nitrogen is going to leach down and reach your roots. So, so that's good for that. But you've got fertilizers like phosphorus, which are pretty much immobile in the soil. So wherever you place it, it's slowly going to degrade. It could be here, it could be here. It's going to degrade slowly, but it's not going to move and it's not water soluble. So you may experience deficiencies even when top dressing with phosphorus. Uh, so we mix it in. So it's already available uh, where the roots are going to grow and that helps us achieve really high yields. So if you're wondering if you're not, why you're not getting high yields on your fruiting plants and you're only top dressing, that might be part of the reason why. So finding a way to incorporate plant food right in the root zone when you transplant is critical to, get, to getting good results. It's really important that you think about how you're going to support your plants before you actually uh, plant them or, or put them where they're going to grow. Uh, these plants are San Marzano tomatoes, so they are an indeterminate variety, which means they will vine for as long as the frost doesn't kill them, which is never going to happen in here. So we need to be ready to one, support the plants, and two, lower the actual stems that are unproductive after fruiting. So uh, we, we will have to terminate these plants at some point, but preparing these strategies uh, before we plant will allow us to have a more bountiful and more successful harvest overall. So, so planning is a big part of things. Uh, you guys know I'm a really big fan of, of being organized and planning things out and logistics and whatnot. So these plants here are gonna get actually uh, a rope tied around the bottom here, which we're going to twist around the stem, and we're just going to bring that up to the ceiling where we're going to have a hook with uh, the roll of twine here is already prepared. So we're just going to basically put some S hooks in the uh, ceiling, drop those down, and train our tomatoes upwards. So I'll just take a quick break. We'll be right back with the uh, the rest of the job finished, pretty much. All right, here we go. So we're all done. Our plants are in their container. We had a little accident while uh, while doing this, and the third plant actually broke off and died. So, so we're going to be going with two plants, but that's okay. We can actually do uh, something pretty good with those two plants here. So if you look at the uh, the plants, they are actually tied uh, with a piece of twine here, which is then twisted around the plant, and then we've got a really sturdy hook here at the top. Uh, so it's tied up, piece of twine, super solid. If you notice, I've left a length of twine here. So when the time comes to actually lower the unproductive portions of the plant, which have already fruited, we're going to use that and I'll show you guys how to do it so that you can actually uh, lower the plant, keep it uh, basically at eye level, keep the interesting parts at eye level. That's going to allow you to manage your plants easier. So we've done the same thing uh, with the other plant as well. So same thing here. Uh, basically, uh, they are S hooks with twine and we've got that going all the way down and tied around our plant here. So uh, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. I'll keep you posted with updates on what happens here. Uh, we've actually watered these plants pretty well. Uh, it's going to be a while before we water them again because the plants are small, the containers are large. Uh, but as soon as there's something interesting, we'll post new updates. And I hope that has inspired some of you guys to maybe set up your own indoor garden. See you next time.